<clears throat> so last week we began by looking at how the Constitution was written, the um, <clears throat> Constitutional Convention, the debates, and why the Constitution was called a bundle of compromises. But once the con it was agreed upon uh, by the delegates um, to have a Constitution, and once the Constitution was constructed, the next step was to get the states to ratify the Constitution. Nine of the 13 states had to approve it or else it would not be the law of the land. So each state legislature was expected to call for the election of delegates to attend ratifying conventions where within each state they would vote whether to approve or to reject the Constitution. Now, the most brilliant tactic of those who supported ratification was to call themselves Federalists. And by doing so, they branded their opponents anti-Federalists, um, those who felt that the Constitution gave too much power to the central government at the expense of the states. The Federalists made full use of the 18th century's available media. They filled newspapers with essays and letters defending the Constitution. Now, the anti-Federalists were in a very difficult position because they agreed that the Articles of Confederation needed to be changed, but they didn't like the new proposed government that and so what alternative did they have? So we had the Federalists who favored ratification. Um, they favored a powerful central government, whereas the Anti-Federalists opposed ratification. And they argued that any government that placed authority in the hands of just a few powerful people that that would lead to tyranny and despotism. Therefore, they favored a weak central government, a government that would not threaten the power of, that is vested in the states. Now, ultimately, um, it was agreed that after ratification, there would be a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution to protect people's civil liberties. And that was instrumental in getting anti-federalists to ratify the Constitution. Now, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison defended the Constitution in a series of essays collectively known as the Federalist Papers. Uh, it was about some 60 odd essays, two thirds of them were written by Alexander Hamilton. And these essays anticipated every possible objection to ratification and they provided cogent rebuttals to these objections. The most famous of the Federalist Papers was Federalist number 10, which refuted the conventional wisdom that it was impossible to extend a Republican form of government over such a large territory as the new United States. Remember in history, the only successful republics were over relatively small territories such as the Greek city-states or Swiss cantons. So there was a uh, prevailing wisdom that you could not have a republic over such a vast territory. But Federalist number 10 refuted that argument. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, it was agreed that a Bill of Rights would be added to the Constitution. And so the first 10 amendments to our Constitution uh, <clears throat> consists of the Bill of Rights, which limits the power of the federal government. It protects the rights of citizens. And this was the very thing that the anti-federalists were concerned about. They didn't want a powerful federal government 
to abuse the rights of individuals. And so when you look at the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights does not talk about the power given to the government. Rather, it enumerates the rights that government cannot take away from the people. So the, the body of the Constitution itself represents power given to the federal government. The Bill of Rights, on the other hand, represents protection against the power of the federal government. Uh, freedoms such as the government cannot take away freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, uh, trial by jury, and all of that. And so when it came to voting whether to approve or reject the Constitution, Delaware was the first state to ratify. <clears throat> New Hampshire became the ninth state. So this is a very famous cartoon showing the process of ratification. Remember, you needed nine of the 15 states to ratify. And so Delaware here, this first pillar on the left, was the first state legislature to ratify, followed by Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, and New Hampshire became the ninth state. Now, <clears throat> um, those state legislatures ratified the Constitution on the assumption that the Bill of Rights would be added. And the Bill of Rights was added after ratification. So in January of 1789, George Washington was unanimously elected president of the United States. Uh, all the electors voted for George Washington. Um, now, in those days, electors had two votes. And so the candidate who came in with the second most electoral votes was John Adams. So John Adams served as George Washington's vice president. And um, the Constitution actually became the supreme law of the land after Washington's election. Um, that was on March 4th. Um, that is when the final ratification occurred. And on April 30th, 1789, that's when George Washington took office. So in those days, the election was in January and the uh, president-elect took office at the end of April. Now, <clears throat> um, six months after this, the Bill of Rights was ratified. Now, North Carolina voted against ratification and Rhode Island never even summoned a ratifying convention. Thus, North Carolina did not enter the Union until November 21st, 1789, when it finally ratified the Constitution. Um, and Rhode Island did not ratify <clears throat> until more than a year after the uh, Constitution uh, was written. So before we look at the powers given to the legislative and executive branch, I would just like to offer some observations about the Constitution. Because the delegates disobeyed the state legislatures by not just amending the Articles of Confederation, but by getting rid of it entirely, the Constitutional Convention was really in effect a bloodless coup d'etat. That is an overthrow of the existing government. The existing government was the Articles of the Confederation. But what the 55 delegates in Philadelphia did was to get rid of that government. But no one at Philadelphia knew how it would turn out at the end. In fact, many of the framers were less than enthusiastic when they signed the document. But Benjamin Franklin, ever the optimist at the age of 81, gave a restrained assessment in his final speech before the Constitutional Convention when he said, when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevit inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, 
their local interests and their selfish views. So Franklin recognized how difficult it would be to run a country with so many different ideas and political viewpoints. And so he thought that it would be impossible to expect a quote, perfect production from such a gathering, but he believed that the constitution that they had just drafted with all its faults was better than any alternative that was likely to emerge. And it was compromise that saved the day, which is why the constitution is referred to as a bundle of compromises. But the delegates took the most difficult problem off the table. And that was, of course, slavery. And by doing so, the Constitution worked. Because if slavery had been abolished, there never would have been a United States of America, because the Southern delegates would have walked out. Nor did the Constitution address the rights of women or of Native Americans. Now, throughout history, the question of who should have power is often decided by bloodshed. France, for example, in 1792, tried to resolve that question through violence. And the result was the reign of terror during the French Revolution. But at the same time that France was having a violent revolution, the United States resolved the issue by creating a constitution that established a balance between powers given to state governments and power given to the central government. And the United States has experienced only a few episodes of widespread domestic violence. And that is unique in world history. The success of the constitution can be seen by the fact that the United States is now the oldest enduring republic with the oldest enduring constitution in world history, with a set of political institutions and traditions that has stood the test of time. But the conflicts at the constitutional convention would be played out later in American history. The question of slavery would ultimately be resolved only through civil war. The conflict between states' rights and federal power would continue to be an issue after the writing of the Constitution. And in the issue of personal liberties, the Supreme Court would have to issue rulings about particular liberties in the Bill of Rights. The founding fathers did not expect this constitution to endure over the centuries. Their ultimate achievement was in creating an amendment process that built in flexibility. They knew there would be problems coming up in the future that could not be dealt with by the body of the constitution. And so they wrote into the constitution a way to amend the constitution so that it could come to grips with unanticipated problems. However, that amending process was deliberately made to be very difficult. Now, the idea that the founders would provide an instrument to amend the constitution was a gesture that my fellow historian Carol Birkin said, freed future generations from the icy grip of the past. I think that's a very cogent statement. The amendment process freed future generations from the icy grip of the past. So let's take a look at how the constitution could be amended. It could be amended one of two ways by two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate, it could, an amendment can be proposed. Or an amendment can be proposed at a convention called by two thirds of the states. 
Now, this has never happened. The second, uh, there has never been uh, a convention called for amending the Constitution. So all amendments to the Constitution were proposed by two thirds of, e of the House and two thirds of the Senate. Once the amendment is proposed, there are two ways to ratify. If three quarters of the state legislatures ratify, then the amendment is approved. And so today, this would require uh, 38 states to approve an amendment. Or an amendment could be approved by three quarters of ratifying conventions in the states. And this too has never happened. Uh, there's never been an amendment that has been adopted through ratification conventions. Every amendment has been adopted when three quarters of state legislatures approved it. And so <clears throat> the Constitutional Convention is often referred to as the miracle at Philadelphia because it attempted to solve an insolvable political problem. How to create a powerful central government while remaining true to the principles of 1776. That is, how do you create a powerful federal government, but also make sure that that government will not abuse its powers? It attempted to create a unified nation out of 13 states that had very different interests. And it was a miracle because it succeeded. 1776 declared American independence, but 1787 heralded the founding of an American nation. Now, the question has been uh, proposed, how democratic was this new constitution? And by our standards today, it wasn't very democratic. So for example, it was a blend of both democracy and aristocracy. The most democratic feature about the new government was the House of Representatives. That was the only body that was intended to be elected by the people, by eligible voters. The Electoral College was intended as a check against the people's will. It was created so that if the people elected a, a candidate that the elite did not think worthy, then the Electoral College would vote in another direction. Well, since then, most states have committed their electoral votes to the candidate that wins the popular vote, much to the chagrin of our current president. Uh, but when the Electoral College was first created, the electors did not have to vote according to the popular vote in their states. So the Electoral College itself is not in line with democracy. Also, originally, senators were not elected by the people. Senators were elected by state legislators. So that's another undemocratic feature. Majorities cannot amend the Constitution. So if 51% of the um, House and the Senate wants to amend the Constitution, that's not enough. You need a supermajority. You need three quarters of the states to ratify an amendment. Another undemocratic feature, the smallest 26 states can prevent laws from being passed. Why? Because these 26 states would have 52 senators. And if 52 senators vote against a law, it's not gonna become a law. Yet these smallest 26 states represent just a small fraction of the American population. In fact, the 13 smallest states 
can prevent the Constitution from being amended. Remember, you need 38 or 39 states. Um, the thir 13 smaller states vote against it, it won't be amended. Those 13 smaller states just represent 4% of the population. So in other words, 4% of the population can reverse the will of 96% of the population. But again, the Constitution was an 18th century document. And we are stuck with some of the undemocratic features, such as the Electoral College. Uh, the fact that senators are elected by state legislatures, that has been changed by the 17th Amendment, so that uh, senators are now elected by the people, just as is the House. Now, the big issue at the Constitutional Convention was how do you create an effective central government and make sure that a powerful central government would not abuse its powers? The lasting legacy of the colonial experience was concern over the tyranny of a powerful government. And so as a result, in proposing a system of government, the framers were consistently concerned about the potential abuse of power. James Madison in particular knew a lot about human nature. He said, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And as a result, the constitution established a system of separation of powers among the three branches of government. And so the powers were divided. The power to enact laws was given to a two house legislature made up of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The power to enforce law was given to the executive branch and the power to interpret law given to the judicial branch. Now, Article One of the Constitution describes the power of the legislative branch because the legislative branch was intended to have the greatest power in the new government. Article two addresses the powers of the chief executive and article three gives the judiciary power to interpret the law. But the framers did not set boundaries between the three branches, at least these boundaries were not absolute. So instead they created a system of checks and balances in which each branch could exercise some restraint over the other branches. And so if we look at this diagram, it shows the three branches of government. And if you look at these arrows, it shows how the legislative branch can stop the executive branch from amassing too much power. And so, for example, the president could set a budget, but the legislative branch has to approve it. The legislative branch passes laws. The president can veto laws, but the legislative branch can override a president's veto by a two thirds vote in both houses. Another control that the legislative branch has over a president who may become too powerful is the power of impeachment. And the executive branch has power over a legislative branch. Let's say the legislative branch passes a law that says that Congress shall remain in power for life. Well, the executive branch can veto that law, but the legislative branch can override that veto. And this is where the judicial branch comes in because the Supreme Court can then declare laws passed by Congress unconstitutional. The legislative branch has influence over the judicial branch because the Senate confirms nominees to the Supreme Court. So you can see how ingenious this system is. It prevents any one of these three branches of government from amassing too much power. And that's what the delegates were most concerned about, checking the abuse of 
power. Now, <clears throat> we are going to look at um, the nature of federalism. The Constitution called for a federal system. What a federal system means is you have a central government that has specific powers, but there are also powers that are denied to the central government, but reserved to the states. So you can see here in the blue circle, these powers are specifically delegated in the Constitution to the federal government. Any power not specifically delegated to the federal government is reserved to the states. And so here you see in red, these are powers that are not mentioned in the Constitution, and therefore they belong to the states. So for example, schools, education is not mentioned in the Constitution. Therefore, it is up to the states to establish and maintain schools. Trade within states is not mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, state elections is not mentioned. So all of these are reserved to the states. However, there are some powers that are shared by both the central government and state governments. These are called concurrent powers. And so in this Venn diagram, you can see these powers that overlap are powers that both the federal government and state government can exercise. So both have the power to raise taxes. And so we pay federal taxes and we pay state taxes. Both provide for public welfare. Both have criminal justice systems. The federal government for federal crimes, states for state crimes. Both states and federal government can borrow money. So you can buy federal bonds and you can buy state bonds. Both have the power to charter banks. So there are federal banks and state banks and both can build roads. And so you have federal interstate highways and you have state roads. And so um, this is how the delegates try to solve the question of how much power to give to a central government and how much power to reserve to the states. Now we're going to take a look at the preamble to the Constitution. The preamble begins with words that we're all familiar with. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Now this preamble does not have the force of law. It does not grant any power to federal or state governments. It does not limit the scope of any future government action. What it does though, is to state the general purpose of the Constitution. So I think it's worth looking at the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. I'm not sure about the grammar of that because can something be more perfect? If it's perfect, that, well, anyway, <laughs> to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. It's a very long sentence, but I think it's eloquent in explaining the reason why we have a constitution. Now, the very first phrase, we the people, this is a clear statement of popular sovereignty. It doesn't say we the states. We the people implies that the government was created by the people and that the people also have the power to change or amend the government. And so we may rightfully point out that we the people in 1789 did not include African Americans. It did not include women or Native Americans or white 
men with our property because they were not allowed to vote. So we, the people in 1789, really included a minority of people living in the country at that time. But the amendments would broaden the definition of the people when women got the right to vote and African-Americans got the right to vote. And the preamble then goes on to list six goals of the new government to form a more perfect union. The government that it was replacing, the Articles of Confederation, was hardly a perfect union. And so this constitution was needed to form a more perfect union. To establish justice. Now, the absence of a system of justice ensuring fair and equal treatment has been was the primary reason for the American Revolution. The revolutionaries did not feel that they were treated justly. And so this constitution was intended to establish the mechanism to provide justice. To ensure domestic tranquility. Now, this is a reference to Shays' Rebellion, which I pointed out last week that in 1786, before under the Articles of Confederation, um, farmers in Western Massachusetts um, were very upset about taxes they had to pay, and they rose up in rebellion. And so this new government is intended to suppress domestic unrest and to create uh, a peaceful country. And it was formed to provide for the common defense. Now the framers were acutely aware that the new nation was extremely vulnerable to attack by foreign nations. The new nation was very weak and no individual state had the power to repel any attack. And so there was a need for a unified, coordinated effort to defend the nation as a whole. Um, and that is a reason why the Constitution was written, to provide for the common defense of the entire country. To promote the general welfare, the framers also recognized that the general well-being of the American citizens would be another key responsibility of the new federal government. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, while this may seem like a clear statement of intent, some of these goals are ambiguous. For example, common defense. That could mean a whole range of things. It could mean military things, it could mean other things. It doesn't require the government to maintain a standing army. It doesn't require the government to even maintain any army, but just to have one if necessary. In fact, the US Constitution does not at any point mandate that the government have a standing military. The standard practice at the time was to call upon militiamen who were ordinary citizens and they would be called upon to fight the country's defense if military action were necessary. The phrase to promote the general welfare. What exactly is meant by promoting? Does that mean the active management of the general welfare or just setting up an environment that seems principally correct? Or does it mean something else? What exactly is contained in the term welfare? In other words, what level of well being is to be promoted by the government? How does the adjective general in general welfare affect the definition of welfare? Does it mean only well being related to interactions between citizens? Securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. This expresses the hope that the Constitution will endure. And finally, do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. 
This last phrase finishes the we the people in the first clause of this very long sentence. The preamble is one sentence. And this last phrase underscores that the constitution and the government it embodies are created by the people and that it is the people who give the government its power. So clearly this preamble sets the constitution apart from the Articles of Confederation uh, because the Articles of Confederation was an agreement among the states, but the constitution is an agreement among the people. And that's important to keep in mind because when Southern states seceded in 1861, they maintained that they had the right to secede because the government was created by the states and therefore states could leave the government. But the fact is the government was created by the people and therefore states do not have the right to secede. Okay, now let us look at the legislative branch of the government. The framers of the constitution clearly expected Congress to overshadow the other two branches of government. And that is why article one refers to the legislative branch. In fact, article one is the longest part of the constitution. It's longer than articles two and articles three combined. So article one, section one says, all legislative powers shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Article two is devoted specifically to the House of Representatives. The House was the only part of the new constitution that would be chosen by the people themselves. And so the framers determined that representatives should serve for only a two year term. And the reason why they ordained such a short term was that if a representative once elected did not please his constituents, then he could be voted out of office in two years. Now, critics charge that two years is too short, that representatives are always running for re-election. They have no time to focus on political issues. They're always fundraising for their next election. But those who support the two-term uh, designation argue that frequent elections keep members of the House close to the people. That is, they have to please their constituents. Now, because some Western states granted women the right to vote, a woman, Jeanette Rankin of Montana, was elected to Congress in 1916. And that's rather significant because Jeanette Rankin was elected to the House of Representatives in 1916 before women had the right to vote in federal elections. Women did not get the right to vote in federal elections until 1920. Article 1, Section 2 also sets out the terms of qualifications for serving in the House of Representatives. So you must be at least 25 years of age. You must have been a citizen for at least seven years and you must be a resident of the state when you are elected to Congress. Now, um, you don't have to live in the congressional district that you represent. So someone, for example, who represents uh, Los Angeles could live in Orange County, um, but that representative must live somewhere in California at the time that the representative is elected. Now there's no limit on how many terms a representative could serve. John Dingell of Michigan uh, holds the record having served 59 years and 21 days in Congress. In 1929, Congress limited the House of Representatives to 435 members. And so the number of representatives from each state is determined by the population of that state. 
And that population is determined by the census taken every 10 years. And that's why this year is a census year and why it's so important that every head get counted. Now the Trump administration wanted to exclude illegal immigrants from being counted. But the constitution clearly says that every 10 years there shall be a census of all persons residing in each state. It doesn't say all citizens, it says all persons. And so the Supreme Court ruled that the census should also count those who are living in a state who are not citizens. And so California, which is the most populous state, has 53 representatives. There are six states that have only one representative because they have such a relatively small population. And so here we see uh, the apportionment of representatives based on the 2010 census. Now that's gonna change somewhat after this year because some states gain population and other states lose population. Now, these numbers do not reflect electoral votes. They just reflect the number of representatives in the House. But every state has two senators. So you can add two to each state to figure out the electoral uh, vote that each state has. State legislatures are empowered to draw district lines. And that leads to what is called gerrymandering where they create congressional districts that favor the party that has a majority in the state legislature. And here's an example of how gerrymandering can swing elections. And so here is um, North Carolina. And so um, this was the congressional map in 2012 and 2014, but if the Democrats had gained the state legislature, whoops, this is the way it could look. So you can see how gerrymandering favors one party over another. Now, Article 1, Section 2 states that when a representative dies or resigns during his or her term, the governor of the state can call for a special election to fill the vacancy. And section two also says that members of the majority party, members of the house should choose their speaker. And so it generally comes from the majority party. And that is why Nancy Pelosi is the speaker of the house because Democrats have a majority in the house. Now, the position of the Speaker of the House was originally intended just to be a moderator, someone who would maintain order. But over time, the Speaker has played a crucial role in designing legislative strategy. So when Nancy Pelosi originally stated that she was, imposed, she was opposed to the impeachment of Donald Trump, the House did not impeach. And then when she changed her position, that is when the House voted for impeachment. And lastly, section two of article one states that the House shall be the sole, have the sole power of impeachment. So here is a, um, um, a, a ticket admitting anyone who holds this to the visitors gallery in the, uh, the discussions over the impeachment of Richard Nixon. He was not impeached because he resigned before the House could vote on it. Article 1, Section 3 pertains specifically to the Senate. The Senate shall be composed of two senators from each state, but originally they would be chosen by state legislators and they would serve for a six year term. Now the 17th amendment passed in 1913 changed that so that today the people elect senators from each state. 
Now, the Constitution called for one third of the Senate to stand for election every other year so that the entire Senate would not be up for re-election at the same time. Now, the entire House is up for re-election every two years. But in the Senate, just one third has to stand for election every other year. The qualifications for serving in the Senate, a senator must be at least 30 years of age, a citizen of the United States for at least nine years, and a resident from the state that elected him or her. <clears throat> now, the vice president of the United States is also president of the Senate. And that's important because if the Democrats win the two Senate races in Georgia on January 5th, that will result in a Senate that is half Democrat and half Republican, which would give Kamala Harris the deciding vote because when she becomes vice president, she will have a vote in the Senate if there is a tie. And so that will give Democrats a majority in the Senate. Now, once the House votes for impeachment, the Senate serves as the jury in impeachment cases, and they can only convict an impeached president by two thirds majority. When Andrew Johnson was impeached in 1868, a majority of the senators voted to convict him, but they were one vote short of a two thirds majority. And so no president who has been impeached has been convicted. Now, Article 1, Section 4 calls for Congress to meet at least once a year. Section 5 says each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and within the concurrence of two thirds, expel a member. Now, one of the rules that the Senate has adopted is the filibuster. Filibuster is a way to delay or stop a vote by talking a bill to death. So there's a certain time limit in which a bill can be debated. And so if you filibuster, you use up that time until the time expires and then there is no vote on the bill. And so the Senate adopted the filibuster in 1805. And in 1917, it ruled that 60 senators could vote to end the filibuster. This is called cloture. So in other words, today, a bill must have the support of 60 senators. A simple majority would not be enough. Now, Article 1, Section 5 says that each house can punish its members for disorderly behavior. And so when Senator Joe McCarthy was running his witch hunt in the early 1950s, he fell out of favor with the Senate and the Senate voted to censure him. Now, what that means is that if a Senator is censured, that when he gets up to speak in the Senate, Nobody has to listen. In fact, very often they can walk out. Now, the Senate also adopted a rule that a senator can be expelled by a two thirds vote. That has not happened yet. Um, I'm sorry, let me correct that. Um, it has happened. 15 senators and five representatives have been expelled for various reasons. 17 of the, those 20 who were expelled, it was because they joined the Confederacy in the Civil War, which is a good reason to expel them. The last congressman to be expelled was Representative Jim Traficant of Ohio. And this was in 2002. He was expelled from the House of Representatives for bribery, tax evasion, and racketeering. Now, Section 7 of Article 1, 
states that all money bills must originate in the house because the house is elected by the people. Um, and section seven also describes how a bill becomes a law. And um, this diagram shows that a bill could be introduced in either the House or the Senate, unless it's a money bill, then it must be introduced in the House. A bill that is introduced then goes to committee. The committee votes whether to send the bill to the floor. Uh, it is, if it's sent to the floor, it is then debated and the House then votes on it. A similar procedure takes place in the Senate. Well, let's say the House approves one version of the bill and the Senate approves a different version. Then it goes to what is called a conference committee where they try to iron out the difference. And if they do, they can then send it to the president for his signature. The president could either sign it or veto it. If the president vetoes it, it goes back to each house and each house could override the presidential veto, but only by a two thirds vote. So most bills never become law. Section eight offers a laundry list of 17 specific powers given to Congress. It specifically grants Congress the power to tax and to authorize expenditures of all federal funds. It gives Congress power over the executive branch in that the president must appeal to Congress for funding any project that the president wants. And that is why Trump's declaration of an emergency in order to build his border wall violated Congress's right to authorize federal expenditures. Now, he might have had the right to do so if there was an actual emergency, but he never proved that there was such an emergency. Article eight says that Congress has power to borrow money on the credit of the United States. And so, as you know, we are living on credit and it's because article one, section eight empowered Congress to do so. Congress has the right to regulate trade with foreign nations and also trade between states, which is called interstate commerce and trade with Indian tribes. But Congress does not have the power to regulate trade within states. Congress can establish rules for naturalizing citizens. Congress and only Congress has the power to coin money, to establish post offices, to declare war, to raise and support armies and navy, to call forth militias, to suppress insurrections. And, and this is most significant, section eight ends by saying that Congress shall make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. This is called the necessary and proper clause. It's also called the elastic clause because it gives Congress lots of leeway. Now, conservatives um, tend to argue that Congress should only have those powers that are explicitly given in, in section eight, the powers that we went over. Liberals argue that the framers intended Congress to have not just those powers, but implied powers. That Congress should be able to make laws which are necessary for carrying out the duties of government. And that led to a debate between those like Alexander Hamilton, who favored a broad or loose interpretation of the constitution in order to give more power to the central government. And those like Jefferson, who argued for a narrow interpretation of the constitution that would limit the power of the national government. 
For example, Hamilton believed that Congress had the implied power to establish a national bank. Now there's nothing in the constitution that gives Congress the power to establish a national bank, but it does give Congress the right to make laws that are necessary and proper for carrying on government powers. And so Hamilton argued that a national bank was necessary for effective government. Jefferson, on the other hand, said that <clears throat> the government should ha not have the right to create a national bank because it is not explicitly stated in the constitution. And so this debate between enumerated powers expressly stated in the constitution and implied powers in this uh, necessary and proper clause has been debated throughout American history. And this shows the two sides on the debate. Now, often the Supreme Court rules on whether a law passed by Congress is based on an implied power or whether Congress did not have the constitutional right to pass that law. So for example, in 1990, Congress passed a law banning the possession of handguns near schools. And Congress based that law on the Commerce Clause because handguns are manufactured in one state but can be bought in another state. Now, in a case, US versus Lopez, the Supreme Court, Supreme Court ruled that that law was unconstitutional because it said that it did not have a substantial impact on interstate commerce, that Congress did not have the right to ban handguns near schools because that was not explicitly stated in the constitution. Uh, and even though a gun was made in one state and could be carried into another state, that did not give Congress sufficient justification for passing that law. Article one, section nine also places specific restrictions on Congress. So for example, it forbids Congress from importing slaves from banning the importation of slaves before 1808. Also, Congress may not suspend the writ of habeas corpus during times of peace. Habeas corpus is a protection against arbitrary arrest. It requires a court to show cause why a prisoner is being held, but it may be suspended during times of war or rebellion. But the Constitution does not state whether Congress or the president has the power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And this came up during the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. Article 1, Section 9 forbids Congress from passing a bill of attainder. That's a legislative act that punishes a person without a trial. Congress may not pass ex post facto law, that is to punish someone for breaking a law that was not a crime earlier. So for example, if uh, spitting on the sidewalk was not a crime yesterday, but Congress passes a law today then you cannot be convicted for what you did when it was not a law. That was called ex post facto law. Congress has no power to tax exports. It can tax imports, those are called tariffs, but it cannot put a tax on goods leaving the United States. Section nine says that Congress may not grant titles of nobility. So there were no lords or kings or princes Section 10 sets limits on the powers of the states. States are not allowed to make treaties with other countries. States are not allowed to coin money 
or do any of the things prohibited to Congress in Section 9. So um, that covers how the framers empowered Congress uh, through the um, sections in Article 1. Now, uh, we didn't get to the executive branch, but we will pick up on that uh, next week. So 